This is the Bible. This is the standard of truth for us. This is God's Word. It tells us what's true in life, what we are to do in life. Uh, it's what sets our lives on the right path. It's what clears up the inconsistencies, the gray in our life. It's what we hold to as truth. But this particular Bible is old. It's lost its binding. It's fallen apart. It's missing pages. It's missing even books of the Bible. And in many ways, this illustrates something about our culture. For many people in our culture, and even many Christians, this used to be the standard of truth. They used to trust in it. But it's grown old, and it's fallen apart. And for them, it's not the standard of truth anymore. Either because they don't believe what it says, or because they just don't read it, the Bible gradually falls apart in their minds and little piece by little piece the Bible becomes empty. It's nothing but an empty shell. A nice looking, religious looking shell. But there's nothing in here for them to tell them about how to live to tell them about what to do. For them, they would much rather do whatever they feel is right. Whatever this world has told them is true. Because for them, the Bible is just empty. And we're afraid of this, aren't we? Many of us look at this, a world that has an empty Bible in their heads. We see a world that is gradually and increasingly becoming less and less Christian and more and more non-religious, not even believing in God. And we wonder to ourselves, is our culture too far gone? Is, is God still willing to work? Is the Lord still willing to work in a culture that has largely abandoned Him? Well, this morning, we're going to look in that Bible to see an answer to how God can and does work in a culture just like ours. So would you open your Bible with me to chapter 4 of Judges as we see together what God says about a time like ours and what he will do in our time. We're going to continue this study of characters by looking at the story of Deborah and Jael, leaders of men. Leaders of men. So turn with me to Judges chapter 4, and we'll begin by looking through the story of Deborah and Jael in chapter 4, and then we'll look at the truths that it teaches us. So let's begin by looking at the story of Deborah and Jael in Judges chapter 4. Starting in verse 1. After Ehud died, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord uh, sold them into the hands of Jabin, a king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Herosheth Hagoyim. And because he had 900 iron chariots and had cruelly oppressed and the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. This story takes place in Israel at a time just like ours. Judges 17.6 describes this period saying, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. This is a time of moral relativity. This is a time when God's word and truth were simply abandoned and everyone did what they thought was right, much like our own time. And this relativistic and egotistic culture plunged itself in sin after sin after sin. Judges 2 
describes this for us and describes what happens over and over and over again in the book of Judges and the period of the Judges. It says this, Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They provoked the Lord to anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them just as he had sworn to them. They were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Moving on in verse 18. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord had compassion on them as they groaned under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their fathers, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. The people of the book of Judges... God's people are a people who totally abandon God. And after God saves them in compassion, they go even further into sin. For a moment, they repent in faith, and as soon as things are well again, they turn back to sin, just as quickly as they turn back to God. This describes what people refer to in the book of Judges as the cycles of sin. Uh, The person who put this together calls it the cycles of apostasy. And what we see in this cycle is it starts with apostasy or sin, sin against God, worshiping other gods. Uh, Then God allows them to to be handed over into bondage. Uh, The people have repentance and they cry out to God and he delivers them and gives them peace. But just as soon as that deliverance comes, they repeat the cycle all over again by going back into sin. And this cycle happens over and over and over and over again in the book of Judges. So that of all the periods in Israel's history, the period of the Judges was one of the absolute worst. And Judges 4 will describe one of these cycles. But let's continue reading in chapter 4, verse 4 says this, Deborah, a prophetess, was the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead the way to Mount Tabor. I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him excuse me, into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Very well, Deborah said, I will go with you, but because of the way you are going about this, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. Now, Israel, we find in these five verses, was weak and lacked courage. For a woman to be a judge and leader of Israel in a male-dominated society demonstrates the lack of courage and leadership at the time. That's what the author's trying to get across to us. In this period, it was shameful for women to have to lead men. And that is why Deborah says to Barak at the end of the passage here, Uh, The Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman, and you won't get credit for it. Later in Judges, we see this even more clearly. In Judges chapter 9, verses 52 to 54, another leader by the name of Abimelech went to the tower and stormed it. But as he approached the entrance to the tower to set it on fire, a woman dropped an upper millstone on his head and cracked his skull. Hurriedly, he called to his armor bearer, draw your sword and kill me so that they can't say a woman killed him. So a servant ran him through and he died. You see, this is so important to not have happened to him in the culture of the time that his last words, his last thoughts were, make sure they don't say that a woman killed me, you kill me instead. That's how bad this is. Now, we can also see it in Barak's refusal to go with Deborah. He says, I'll only go if you go. 
And we also see it uh, that he says this even though God through Deborah has promised that he will be with Barak and God through Deborah has promised that he will give his enemies into his hands. So Barak, we know, lacks courage, should be a leader in Israel, but lacks courage and is led by a woman. Now, before I go further, I have to say, this is not teaching that it is shameful to people to have women lead them. Uh, anyone who is a husband or has been a husband in here will not say anything at this point, right? You, you have led, you have been led by your wife in many ways. And we know that in the church and, and all across uh, our society, women take the lead very often. But sometimes it is because there's a lack of leadership from men. And that is amplified tenfold in a culture and a time where men were below, or where women were below men, were considered below men. So for a woman, Deborah, to be a leader at this time shows how, how lacking they were in leadership. And it shows uh, shame upon Israel. Now, Israel was a weak nation and they lacked courage and leadership. And yes, we should also say that the name of the man who would have been their leader is Barack, but not Barack Obama. I know what you're thinking, but this is not about our president. It's just a coincidence that these two leaders have the same name. But this is the state of Israel at the time in Judges 4. It's an Israel that was weak. It's portrayed as weak. But let's continue reading in verse 10 to see what happened. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh, where he summoned Zebulun and Naphtali. Ten thousand men followed him, and Deborah also went with him. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera gathered together his 900 iron chariots and all the men with him from Herosheth Hagoyim to the Kishon River. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor, followed by 10,000 men. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword, and Sisera abandoned his chariot and fled on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Herosheth Agoyim. All the troops of Sisera fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Sisera, however, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, because there were friendly relations between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the clan of Heber, the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent and she put a covering over him. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him up. Uh, Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, Is anyone here? Say, No. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through the temple into the ground, through his temple into the ground, and he died. Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So she went, or he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with a tent peg through his temple, dead. On that day, God subdued Jabin, the Canaanite king, before the Israelites. And the land, or the hand of the Israelites grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, the Canaanite king, until they destroyed him. God raises up two women, two unlikely women, Deborah and Jael, to lead Israel in defeat of their ruthless enemies. But what are we to make of this story and these two characters, Deborah and Jael? apart from the fact that we'll never be able to take a nap in a tent again <laughs> and we'll never look at a tent peg the same way again. Well, I believe that the main point of this passage is that the Lord works in unusual ways. The Lord works in unusual ways. We asked earlier if our own culture and people were too far gone from God and wondered if God would still work in a culture even as bad as ours. But if Judges proves anything, it is that the Lord works. And he does so because the Lord is always faithful to his people. The Lord is always faithful to his people. 
The Israelites had victory in battle because God was at work in faithfulness. And the text makes this clear uh, by first of all pointing out that the Lord was responsible for victory. Not Israel. Not Barak. Not Deborah. And not Jael. The Lord was responsible for victory. And we see this in several passages throughout verse chapter 4. We also see it uh, starting off in chapter 2. It says this in 2.16, Then the Lord, the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Judges 4, 6 to 7, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and troops to the Kishon River, and give him into your hands. Judges 4, 9, The Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. And then Judges 4, 14 to 15 says, The Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? The Lord routed Sisera. And finally, in verse 23 of chapter 4, On that day God subdued Jabin, the Canaanite king, before the Israelites. Simple point being that God is at pains to prove to his people that he is and will be at work in their lives. And that he's always the one who is ultimately responsible for their salvation, for their victory, Israel and us, we need to give credit where credit is due. In February of this year, a bus driver in Dayton, Ohio, nearly lost his life. But his story proves that God is at work. I'd like to read that for you. It says this. A bus driver is recovering Monday night after being attacked on the job. He would have been killed, but for a little divine intervention... It is said that faith can move mountains. Now it appears it can stop bullets. I'm a bus driver at RTA. I got shot, Rick Wagner said. And by the time bus driver Rick Wagner was able to call for help, he had already been shot, stabbed, and forced to fight for his life. Wagner was on his route Monday morning when his bus suddenly stopped due to a mechanical problem. That's when he says he was approached by three men who had no intention of letting him live. He was shot three times and also stabbed, but amazingly, his injuries are non-life-threatening, Sergeant Michael Pauley said of the Dayton Police Department. The bus surveillance camera was rolling when Ragnar was attacked. The bullets hit Wagner in the chest, but when he looked down, there was no blood. I just looked at my chest. It just, it just felt like I've been hit by a sledgehammer. I've got a book in my pocket, and I don't think they made it through the book. Well, that book was none other than the good book. Police say Wagner was carrying the Message Bible in his breast pocket. It stopped the bullets from hitting his chest. The three suspects got away, and police believe the trio wanted to kill Wagner as part of a gang initiation. Fortunately for him, the Bible really does save. The Bible is called the sword by the Apostle Paul, but the pen also helped save Wagner's life. That's because he stabbed one of his attackers with one that he had in his breast pocket as well. Wagner is recovering Monday night in the hospital. You see... It's not always as clear as it is in a story like that. Uh, but as in the days of Judges, so in our own, uh, God is the one who proves to us time and time again that he is ultimately responsible for our salvation. He's ultimately the one who is at work behind any success and any good that does happen in our life. And if he wasn't, we would always be much worse off than we are today. But why work to save these people? These people are seemingly unstoppable in their sin. Why be at work to save a people that continues to abandon God and pursue anything and everything outside of God, as many do in our own day? Well, the Lord worked because of his promise to his people. The Lord worked because of his promise to his people. See, it wasn't because his people deserved it or because they were innocently suffering at the hands of the cruel Canaanites. They caused the trials they were in. They sinned and God allowed them to be subdued. But God cares for his people and is committed to them. And he proves this long before chapter 4. Uh, at the beginning of Judges in chapter 2, verse 1, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land that I swore to give to your forefathers. I said, I will never break my covenant 
with you. He proves it. In verse 16, Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them. See, God is committed. He's committed to His people despite their sin. He's committed to us in spite of our sin at times. If we have placed our faith in Christ, He's already died for our sins and it's finished. It's complete. Any sins I may commit in the future, God will not be stopped from committing to me, from being with me, from being with you, working in your life. It may be through discipline, like the Canaanite army was for Israel, but God will never give up. God will never settle for the things that we settle for at times. God will never cast us off as not worthy enough for his commitment. God is committed to us, and he's promised. He's promised by the blood of his own son, and that can never be taken away. It can never be taken away. God will not abandon his people. But we also see in this story of Judges, not just that God worked, but something interesting and helpful about when he worked. That is that the Lord worked when his people cried out to him in faith. The Lord worked when his people cried out to him in faith. We see this at the very beginning of the story in chapter 4. It says this, After Ehud died, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, a king of Canaan. And then verse 3, <clears throat> they cried to the Lord for help. See, God is a God who is always ready to forgive us and to save us. A God who is committed to us and that commitment will not be stopped regardless of what happens in our life. However, God didn't work in Israel's life to save them until they had cried out in faith, until they called out to their God. He desires our faith first and foremost. Romans 10.13 tells us that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We use that truth to talk about our eternal salvation, but it's true for any salvation we might receive from God. God is waiting for people to call and ask and cry before he works to save. The problem is that oftentimes we don't cry to God. Instead, we just cry. We sulk. We may even blame God for the problems we are in. The problems get bigger and bigger and bigger in our head. Until we're frozen in fear, we're frozen in all we can see is our problems. All we can do is think about ourselves. And if we have not cried out in faith, we should not expect God to save us from those things. Especially if our sin is what caused those things. This is not to say that God will save us every time that we do call out in faith. That he will remove every trial in our life because oftentimes he puts trials in our lives for our own good. But it does mean that we should not expect salvation if we haven't at least minimally cried out in humble faith. So the Lord is always faithful to his people. He is the one who is responsible for our victories and salvation. He works because of his gracious promise of love and not because we deserve it. And he will work to save only when we cry out in faith. But this passage is teaching much more than just that the Lord works. It's also saying something about how in unusual ways. The Lord often uses unusual people. The Lord often uses unusual people. You'll remember, as we talked before, that the Bible 
for the Bible to use women as the heroes of this passage is shameful in this culture of Judges chapter 4. It's shameful to Israelite men of the time, uh, and it demonstrates their lack of courage and leadership, and it was also shameful to the Canaanites who were defeated by these women. But the Lord did so for a very specific reason. The Lord used Deborah and Jael to prove he was at work. The Lord used Deborah and Jael to prove he was at work. It was ultimately for God's glory to use these women. God is not trying to set up women's lib in Judges chapter 4. He's not ready to sing, I am strong, I am invincible, I am woman, as a result of this passage. And he's not trying to shame men into taking their rightful leadership roles. What he's doing is he is showing that he was the one at work. He worked through two people who the world at the time thought were weak and useless and were not leaders, could not accomplish anything to prove that he was the work behind them. He was the hand behind them. So God uses a, an unusual leader, Deborah, over the one who should have been the leader, the military commander, Barak. God uses a woman, Jael, as a warrior and not some man in military uniform to prove that God was ultimately the one who delivered his people. And then this means that the Lord works not just in judges, but also in our life the way he does for his glory and not for ours. We may want to take credit. We may want to say it's because of us that he works. We may want to say that it's our idea that we used a tent peg. But ultimately, God is the one who gets the credit and should. See, ours is a society where everyone fights to be unique and special. Uh, to find something interesting about ourselves that will attract others to notice us. But it's far better to find ways to attract others to the amazing God that we know, who loves us and works through our uniqueness. And what greater thing could we do in life than to lead others to know the God of the universe and to be used by God to prove himself to others? not to prove ourselves to others. This also means that nothing can hinder the Lord's sovereign hand. Nothing. Not these unusual women leaders. Not any king or army or nation that comes against God. You see, our low self-esteem always gets it wrong. This is a picture of the ugliest dog. A few years ago, this dog won an award, and the award was for Ugliest Dog Grand Prize. This is a dog that uh, looks pretty useless for a dog, doesn't it? Looks like a sad excuse for a dog. A dog that no one pays attention to except to laugh at and mock and give a fake award to. A dog that seems pretty insignificant. And maybe, just maybe, we feel a little like this dog. Maybe not that bad. But we feel like, well, how could God really use me? Because of my past, because of my limitations, because I'm ugly, because of whatever those limitations are, whatever those things are that we think are stopping us, our self-esteem, our low self-esteem always gets it wrong because you see, God likes to use ugly dogs. He likes to use what the world mocks, what the world laughs at, what we even think cannot be used, cannot possibly have anything good come from to demonstrate that he's the one at work and he's the one who gets the glory. God often uses unusual people. So don't limit God by your limitations. 
God won't be limited. Don't think that God cannot work you through you because you're not good enough. That may be true. But what is more important is that God is always able to work through unusual, limited people. And He always will. So the Lord often uses unusual people. And He does so to prove that He was at work, but He also uses those of faith. The Lord used Deborah in jail because of their faith. Deborah and jail, may, and jail may have been considered weak and worthless by their culture, but they were women of faith. Of all the characters in Judges 4, they were the strongest, though they were seemingly the weakest, because of their faith. God wants us to emulate Deborah and Jael's faith, and he has given us every reason to place our faith in him. He's given us a book full of reasons to encourage us and inspire us and teach us that he is with us and will use us. But do not think that your faith gives you reason to boast over others either. He often uses others to encourage and challenge our faith just as he used Deborah to encourage Barak and not replace him. He'll use us to encourage others, even others who are failing, because he wants to use us. So where do you need to trust God today? Where do you need to trust God this week? Where do you need to step out in faith Trusting not in yourself, but in your God. The Lord is always faithful to his people. And the Lord often uses unusual people. You know, we are in a time just like the judges. A time when this book is falling apart. A time when people are in their own cycles of sin. But it's also a time that needs this book just as much as any other time. It's a time where this book is just as true and just as relevant as any other time. A time when God's people need to step out in faith with God's word. Just like Deborah in jail. Will you take God's word with me? In this church and on this pulpit, we will make sure that no page, no book is ever left unturned, is ever lost, or ever falls apart. But will you take this word of God with you? Will you take it to your homes? Will you take it to your families? Will you take it to your workplaces? Will you take it to your neighbors? I'd like to tell a story about one of our members that most of all of you know, Nelson Grover. Uh, he's not here this morning, uh, but Nelson Grover is one of the most tender-hearted people I've ever met. One of the kindest men uh, that I've ever met in my life. And Nelson Grover is somebody who holds desperately onto this Word of God. He's also a man who would regularly walk around his neighborhood knocking on doors, his own neighbors that knew him, giving them gospel tracts, praying with them. And as slow as he walks, he would make it to as many houses as he could. But just a few months ago, Nelson Grover uh, fractured his foot and now he's at Sierra View Homes, and he's probably never coming back home. His witness to his neighborhood is probably over. And all of us know many, many Nelson Grovers. People who either are alive today or who have preceded us that have made sure that God's word was known. 
but for whatever reason, aren't able to do that anymore. Will we be a people who continue the Word of God in our neighborhoods, in our culture, in our time? Or will we be content to let it sit on a shelf and fall apart? Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you have given us this precious story of Deborah and Jael. Two unusual leaders at the time, two leaders who are in the middle of a book full of God's own people that have sinned against him, God's own people that have abandoned his word and his truth. And Lord, we know our time is very similar to that time, but as you worked then, through people as unusual as Deborah and Jael, you can work now through people as unusual as us. Lord, would you do that? Now, would you help us, each one of us, to step out this week and even this afternoon to make sure your word is known and continues in our world? We pray this in our Savior's name who's committed everything to us, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, would you stand as we are led in one final song this morning? Amen.